Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Public Allies Platform. I'm your host for today's roundtable. My name is Aisha Sardar, and I'm the Executive Director of Public Allies. We, we have been bringing a, a lot of social causes and a lot of social issues to the table. And today we are here with our panelists again for one such issue. Before we go into it, I just have a small disclaimer, which is important today. <laughs> so we want to say the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed during this discussion are meant solely to create awareness and improve the understanding about LGBTQ community. All information provided or published is for informational purpose only. Reference to any program or service is not an endorsement by public allies and is the choice of the viewers. Often, politically correct terminology requires some time to learn, especially in sensitive topics. We request that all listeners be respectful and be kind to all the speakers and participants and overlook small nuances and errors in terminology. If any words or phrases uttered inadvertently end up causing the listeners to feel aggrieved, hurt, or disrespected, it is completely unintentional and we apologize in advance. If you do not identify with this topic, please watch for awareness. Public Allies is a nonprofit platform and we are here to present dynamic online education on diverse topics that help members of the society enhance their knowledge and better themselves. So that was our disclaimer and going into the topic for today. Diversity is any dimension that can be used to differentiate groups and people from one another. In a nutshell, it is about empowering people by respecting and appreciating what makes them different in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, education, and national origin. It also allows for the exploration of these differences in a safe, positive, and nurturing environment. It means understanding one another by surpassing simple tolerance to ensure people truly value their differences. This allows us both to embrace and also to celebrate the rich dimensions of diversity contained within each individual and place positive value on diversity in the community itself. June being the month for LGBTQ community. Therefore, we have our panelists to discuss the topic. So although it is a taboo topic, even in 2021, we are going towards awareness and education. So thank you all for being here today. And I will take just another few minutes to introduce you all. So going in alphabetical order, Donovan, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Donovan Taylor Hall is a youth speaker, educator, and content creator that focuses on self-development and social emotional skills for kids. Through his work, Donovan allows kids to create a positive self-identity and gives kids the tool to become active facilitators of their growth. Donovan also does one-on-one -on -one coaching for youth to help them build a positive relationship with themselves. Again, thanks for being here, Donovan. Thank you so much. Next, we have Rachel Weinstock. Am I pronouncing your name right, you totally Rachel? Got it. You totally got it. You got it. <laughs> okay, cool. Welcome. Uh, Rachel holds a Bachelor of Visual Arts and a Bachelor of Education. In addition, she has spent over a decade studying public speaking, storytelling, improv improvisational acting, red nose clowning, dance, and life coaching. Rachel has been teaching both locally and in internationally for 15 plus years and was awarded the James W. Fair Leadership Award for the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. She is known as Miss Rainbow Fairy because of her alternative approach to education. She has now dedicated her life to empowering children all over the world to live their kindest, most creative and amazing lives. Welcome, Rachel. Or should I call you Miss Rainbow Fairy? You can call me Miss Rainbow Fairy. It's totally fine. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last but not least, we have Sana Kardar, and she's joining us here today from London, UK. Thank you for uh, staying up, Sana. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Sana is a female, hetero, romantic, asexual. 
and pronounces herself she, her. She is a biomedical scientist, former squash player for Pakistan, peace ambassador, and a member of Seeds of Peace. Sana is a women's health activist, especially menstrual health related conditions and associated mental health as an endo warrior herself. She is the founder of Endo Mentalist and Asexual Association Pakistan. She is also a YouTuber and a blogger. Again, Sana, welcome. And welcome Thanks. to all of you. And I'm so happy that all of you are here. Uh, it is such a difficult topic sometimes because, you know, coming out, talking about these topics becomes difficult. But thanks to all of you for being here and ready to talk about it. Anything I missed in your bio you want to add? Well, I realized I didn't put my pronouns. So it's she, her, they, them. Thank you, Sana, for <laughs> reminding us pronouns for like a coming out, uh, you know, episode. So sorry, I forgot that. I feel like it was like a growth moment. Yeah, thank happened, you. I was thank like, oh, you. yes, <laughs> me too. So he, him. So thank you, Sana, for helping, uh, yeah. helping ground us back in that work. And I think it was a really great example of why just having spaces like this to learn and communicate and be open about growth, um, especially in your knowledge of this stuff is really great. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And I'm going to be so much enriched today with the knowledge I'm going to get from all three of you that I, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, let's go ahead with our first question. So please tell us about your experience and where you fall within the LGBTQ community. Uh, alphabetical order, Donovan, you go first. Um, all right, uh, so basically, um, yeah, it's kind of a tough question. I think that I grew up in Virginia um, and in Virginia, I've always been aware of my sexuality, but I think that uh, it felt very black and white. And so it was very much like you're gay or you're straight. There was no bisexuality. There was no other conversations about anything. And so for a long time, I identified as gay um, and didn't ever really feel like that fit, um, especially because where I was from, when we thought about gay men, it specifically focused on gay white men. Um, and so I, as like a mixed black identifying queer person never really saw myself. But when I came to Oakland, California, where it's a very different world, um, I was able to identify a little bit more and use the label as queer, um, more as an umbrella term, because even though I'm 31 and very comfortable in who I am, I'm also realizing that I'm still learning and open to seeing who I love and, and who I end up with in this world. So um, that's just like a little bit of my, I guess, background, I would say. Thanks for sharing it with us, Donovan, because I know it is so difficult and um, you doing it is like giving hope to so many others. Rachel, next comes you along with your cat. I along like her. Along with my cat. So this is Luna Magic Trust Rainbow. And I can say this here because my students are in here and they won't, they go crazy if I say this, but Luna Magic Trust Rainbow Sparkle Bum wine stock because sometimes I have sparkles around my place and she gets a sparkle on her bum. Um, <laughs> so that's actually always part of it. And it's nice because my students actually get to see her because we're online now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apparently she wants to be part of the live. She uh, goes by she, her, just in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> um, uh, and hopefully she won't show her bum in this live. Um, so yeah, so I... Uh, Let's see, I, I'm from Toronto, Canada, and I knew at a very young age I wasn't straight. I was probably like five or six, and I had crushes on my friends. Like some of them were boys, some of them were girls. And I knew at that point, uh, society in the world is not like accepting. And so I will just like grow up and date boys slash men until I'm brave enough to come out. And I literally made that decision as a child, not as eloquently, but I did make that decision. And then when I was in my 20s, I went to art school, as you do, and uh, I think Donovan, and um, <laughs> we're friends, we have like a connection here. Um, and uh, yeah, I was studying art and I had a group of friends that were gay, like one lesbian and one um, gay male, and like it became our crew. And I remember my parents being very concerned that they were like kind of influencing me. And I was like, no, they're helping me to be brave basically. And eventually I came out um, and that was really hard at the time because 
I have a really loving family. They're so supportive. Um, and, you know, my background was I was bullied from grade one until the end of high school. So I had a lot of trauma in terms of uh, feeling attacked. And so, you know, being outside of the heteronormativity, you kind of like are, unfortunately, um, you know, a minority in this world and kind of like, you know, unfortunately a target in many ways. So, you know, it's kind of like another layer of, of my trauma of feeling like scared. And it's funny because the other day I was featured in Powerful Women um, on TikTok, which I applied for, which I was so excited about. And I knew it was a queer creator, but I didn't know that the um, way they were going to introduce it because they had done a series was going to be hot, sexy, OG lesbians. And I was like, oh my God, because I identify as a queer person. And it just was like, it was just like another level of coming out. Like I was like, am I a lesbian? I don't think so. I think I'm queer, like, or pan or so. Yeah, I, I think like there's been many levels and layers to my journey with, um, you know, my sexuality and, and also my gender. I've kind of been, you know, going by they, them a little bit more and just exploring that. Um, and this is actually another level to this because although my teacher name is Miss Rainbow Fairy, um, that's more about like, it's not queer necessarily. It's because I've always thought rainbows are magical and I want school to be a safe space. However, my queer identity, um, you know, since I have been running my own business and running my online program of preteen club um, and using uh, pronouns, hello, excuse me, um, was, uh, the fact that I use my own pronouns um, set the stage and because I'm very open-minded for like 28 kids to come out to me within the year. So I have had so many youth. I actually started saying I have to call them pride teens. I can't call them free teens anymore. Um, and so it's been something for me, another level of just being brave, brave and stepping into um, me as a queer person and me as a teacher, because I, I feel like that's like a weird thing because unfortunately um, there's so much kind of like I, I don't even know what to call it, but just like, you know, teachers can't have like a sexual identity other than a heteronormativity. So it's like, it becomes like a weird thing, but it, it can't be, and it shouldn't be, and we need more representation. So when you asked me to do this, it just felt like a good thing to do. So that's a long answer. I'm long-winded, but that's a long answer. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thanks, thanks for that. And um, it becomes so important, right? Uh, LGBTQ, you cannot use it interchangeably. You need to ask the person and you need to know what it all stands for, what identity, what you identify as. You just can't put everyone in the same category, right? So this is also a learning for all of us because yeah, sometimes you don't understand, right? So it's all right. You just have to be a little more patient and learn. Plus you should be ready to teach, right? Sana, coming to you. What's the yeah. story with um, you? So um, I grew up in Pakistan mm -hmm. um, where I think any sort of relationship before marriage is considered forbidden according to the religion as well. So a lot of people um, who realized that I was asexual recently have actually come to me and told me that they were asexuals before they got married and after that they suddenly converted which is not what it is because just because you don't have any sexual intimacy doesn't mean that you are actually asexual um when i was growing up i was uh, as i was playing squash and football for pakistan i was very tomboyish uh, you know, the term that was quite common back then. Uh, I had boy cut hair and I would mingle with the boys. I didn't have a lot of female friends. And um, I think when we reached a certain age, 15 to six, 17 years old or 16 years old, when everyone is having boyfriends and um, going out dating, I was just not interested. I would have a book. Uh, and I would sit um, or, you know, would be in my squash court or playing the keyboard, totally away from, um, you know, all these things which were quite common back then, uh, secretly messaging boys or, you know, um, there was no concept of messaging girls because, uh, again, LGBT is considered forbidden in Islam and uh, Pakistan being predominantly Muslim country, even today, 
you know, you can't come out openly in Pakistan as an LGBT person. So uh, I did not know what it was uh, when my friends uh, in school and high school were planning, oh, after college, we're going to get married, we're going to go shopping and this and, you know, what kind of clothes they'll wear and designer clothes. I was really not interested in it. And I thought maybe it's just because I grew up in a different household where getting married was not the priority. My parents were very clear that, you know, you need to become financially independent first and then you get to settle down. Uh, or whatever you want to do in life. Uh, marriage was never a priority. So when I came to the UK, um, I had more exposure. Um, again, there was more awareness as well. And eventually I discovered the term asexuality and I read up on it and I realized that this is exactly how I identify. Um, I am touch and sex repulsive. Like if somebody comes near me, I actually freeze. And um, my friends, even the trust, the people I trust, they have also said that uh, sometimes if we touch you without you um, realizing, you actually go cold. Mm -hmm. um, so I just don't like people coming into my personal space. I want them at a distance. So, you know, COVID was not a surprise for me. <laughs> Social distancing <laughs> since forever. Um, so you enjoyed it, in fact. Yes, <laughs> it was good. Um, yeah. So uh, then I realized that I can be romantically involved with people. Mm -hmm. uh, um, hetero romantic, hence. Um, but I cannot indulge in sexual activities because... That's something that is not for me. Um, I have openly come out to everyone, I think, in my social circle, in my family. It's quite hard for people to understand what asexuality is because they're like, uh, we, we don't believe what asexuality is because unlike LGBT, uh, which is there, like, you know, people cannot grasp, grasp the fact that, you know, somebody can live happily without having any sexual intimacy. You don't need that to be happy or satisfied or, you know, that's not the main purpose of life. Um, there have been times when people wanted to convert me. Hmm. Uh, I think most of the asexual people would have gone through the similar um, questions and um, comments by people where they would just want you to convert or try to sleep with them. And, you know, uh, so it that is very, very insensitive. Um, but I am very openly asexual. Uh, I'm not sure if my mother understands it or not, but she's okay. She's like, like, you know, this is the most halal way of life. So go ahead, do whatever you want to do. Yeah, she's happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> but again, guys, thank you so much for coming here and talking about your experience. Um, let's go to the next one. So this is not pertaining to your lives or your experience. This is in general, we want to know, like how does society, religion, culture, and family play into LGBTQ and coming out? Because it's like, you know, coming out is such a important thing. It is also a realization and freeing yourself. It's like freedom for you too. Mm -hmm. So how, how does all this fall in? Rachel, you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was expecting the same order. Um, okay. So, but you're saying not personally? I, I think, okay, well, I'll just, I need. You can, you can talk about your personal life. life if you want to talk about. I'm like when your divergent brain is like. <laughs> you, <laughs> no, you can go ahead, talk about your experience yeah. or you can talk about experience in general of yeah, people yeah. you know, or you want to talk about anything is fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, my background is I'm Jewish. Um, I'm not religious. I grew up um, going to Hebrew school. Um, I speak some Hebrew. Uh, my family is not very religious. Um, so it wouldn't be like, I definitely didn't grow up feeling like, you know, 
like for me, I don't, I believe in like a creator, but I don't believe in like God per se. And that we definitely don't believe in like, you know, heaven and hell. So I, I didn't have, that's, that's actually something I've been like realizing more and more as I hear more people's stories and their journeys of being on the LGBTQ plus spectrum um, is uh, I can't, I can't even imagine how horrible that would feel to think that you're going to go to a place that is like hell um, because of who you are like that I mean because for yeah. me I never believed that so it wasn't an issue um so I guess you know for my religious part it's not an issue um can you Aisha can you repeat because I'm there were like a lot of parts to your question and I'm trying to remember as a neurodivergent person uh, yeah, what, like you know when it comes to religion society yeah family itself what's yeah that? so I would say so okay I'll tell you this um I knew from quite a young age that I was queer. I knew that society didn't accept it. Um, some people know like, you know, what they are when they're young. Some people, you know, I have a really good friend of mine uh, who's a new friend um, and she's doing a lot of stuff about, you know, having been in a straight marriage, uh, heterosexual, you know, and then coming out as a late blooming lesbian. So it's kind of like, you know, I think that people come to their truths in different ways, depending on how much programming they have. Um, if you grew up religious, like I, that's like a whole other level. I didn't grow up religious. Um, so actually I'm grateful for that because if I did, that would be like another level, but I still had the deep programming of heteronormativity. And I think human beings, you know, we equate survival with love. And so if we know that love can be taken away, it literally is like our, our brains like go into like, we're going to die. Like that's what mm -hmm. we equate it with. So um, I knew just kind of being targeted, you know, in terms of my own abuse that I went through with bullying, that kind of like trauma response, like if I come out, like that love could be withdrawn. And I never felt worried, thank God. But also this is not like, it wasn't like perfect. So I never felt worried that I was going to be put out on the street. I never worried that, you know, um, that kind of thing would happen to me. But my parents definitely struggled with uh, when I came out. Um, and so... I felt there and, and they're struggling because, you know, you as a queer, not you, but like me, not you, Aisha, but like me as a queer person, you know, you come to terms with your own, who you are as you move through your life. But then, you know, if, if your parents now have to come to terms with who you are, they have to work through their own internalized homophobia, yeah. their own fear of what will the neighbors think? There's always these freaking neighbors. Who the hell are the neighbors? And why aren't they Mr. Rogers? P.S. <laughs> you know, like our neighbors just have to be so loving and so supportive. We'll be neighbors, you know, like who are these neighbors? So um, I did come out. It took a really long time. My parents struggled. I had a partner. I remember in Costa Rica, they like came to visit me and my partner at the time and like brought these like um like wine glasses to like show an offering but they were still like really awkward but they made an effort um mm -hmm. but fast forward to <laughs> we're going there now fast forward to um you know i i had you know an ex-partner who we were we were somewhat we were serious at the time um thank god that didn't work out but anyways we were serious at the time and um my whole family knew, my immediate family knew, um, but my 95 year old grandmother did not know. And at the time I had, uh, uh, I had no couch in my place because I was poor and working as a substitute teacher. And I had, um, you know, just a bed like in my apartment and my ex-partner was from the States and came to visit me. And my grandmother knew, okay, like this is your friend, but my friend had like, you know, kind of like a more quote unquote stereotypical like style of what a gay person would look like. So like short hair and you know, and uh, my grandmother is very smart and she was like, Rachel, so uh, where's your friend sleeping? And I like turned because I blush easily 50 shades of red and I was like, ah, on, on the couch. But like she knew there was no couch. So then she started investigating with my parents and was asking my parents, like, why is this person like spending time and like staying with Rachel for weeks on end? And my parents messaged me frantically because by this point, you know, 20 years later, they were fine with my sexuality, but they were worried what the rest of the family would think about it. And they said, we have photocopied and printed off the computer 25 pages of how to come out to your loved ones and we have highlighted it for you and we'd like you to talk to Bobby about it and I was like guys I've already come out so many times in my life like mm -hmm. I'm kind of tired of it can you do it and they were like okay 
So they came out to Bobby Rose and um, basically she said she cried a bit, but they went through all the highlights and like reassured the people that it's a good thing. Rachel's happy. This is her being more herself, whatever. And eventually my grandmother actually came around and she was incredible. And then she ended up like when she would buy us presents, she'd include my ex-partner. Uh, when my ex-partner broke up with me and I was really devastated at the time, she took me to Pickle Barrel, which is like a very Jewish restaurant in Toronto, Canada. We had spaghetti and she told me, she's like, Rachel, I remember when my fiance left me and I was devastated, but in time you'll find somebody great. And uh, since then she calls, she always is asking me, like even during COVID, she's like, do you have any special friends? I'm like, I have Aww. lots of special friends, but like not a partner, Bobby, is that what you're asking? Um, yeah, so she's actually like come quite around to, uh, to being open-minded. And I actually thought um, for anybody out there who's listening, who's maybe in the closet or a younger person, I actually thought that I, it's, it's sad, but I thought I would have to wait until she died in order to like come out to the rest of my family. But what I ended up realizing was actually people surprise you sometimes. Not yeah. always. And, and you also have to do it in terms of like your own safety. Like there's a lot of factors involved. I never was afraid for my safety, but your emotional safety is like another layer to this. So um, she surprised me. My parents came around. My sister from the get go was like totally accepting. Um, and yeah, so that's been like a bit of my family journey. That's awesome. And, you know, um, it was difficult, but it was worth it. Right. Because everybody you love accepts it now. Yeah. So you did a good job. I would say like, you know, you did a great <laughs> job, Rachel. <laughs> Sana, I know I come from the same religion as you do, you do and how difficult it is. So how did you tell your parents about it? Um, so I think my dad, my dad passed away before I could come out to anyone. Um, and as soon as he passed away, everyone wanted my sister and I to get married because... Mm -hmm wash hands off us and you know uh get rid of them because we became liabilities uh i was in the university still uh, i think i was in my third year and still had another year to go uh, undergrad my sister was in her second year and we had no plans to get married we had ambitions and i wanted to become a biomedical scientist go into research and other stuff that i had planned off my sister was doing finance um uh, fashion designing so uh at that point my mother took a stand uh very clearly and told people off that back off uh, my daughters have to study first and if they are ready after um, you know, once they finish their education and they want to get married, that's fine, but not right now, which was very brave of her because coming from a society where it's male dominant and, you know, then there are people who would say that, oh, it's my dying wish. My, uh, you know, I had relatives who said that, you know, I'm going to die soon. So I want um, her to get married and see her as a bride and all that. So, I was quite rude and I think probably my entire family, extended family hates me now uh, because I said, you're going to die. Why do you want me to suffer? Mm. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I get blocked all the time by everyone when I tell things like this. Uh, you know, there were people, my friends were getting married and um, I was told, oh, you'll be left alone. You won't have any money. You won't have kids. I'm child free by choice. So I tell them, you know what, I'll get my eggs frozen. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> I have all the answers ready, uh, but it's just that it's very difficult. And um, my mother took that stand at that point, but eventually, uh, you know, the pressure kept on building up. My sister fell in love with somebody, got married. Uh, she's happy. I'm happy for her, uh, you know, if that's what she wanted. But I am not the same person as my sister she's younger than me and especially in a country like Pakistan when a younger sibling gets married and have kids there's more pressure especially if it's girls so yeah. then eventually you know every function my mom goes to people keep asking her when is she getting married is she already married what is happening so any guy they see in my picture is considered to be my boyfriend or I'm already married to him <laughs> um, so my mom's really tired of answering all those questions i tell her you know why don't you direct those people to me and i'll tell them off um 
but eventually, you know, there was a time that some extended family act tried to get me married off to the first person that became available. Uh, and it was kind of, it took a toll on my mental health. It was kind of forced marriage in a way that they, the family of the boy came to my house when I did not even say yes or no. I was just trying to delay it, saying that I'll think about it and I'll let you know. And then eventually I had to tell my mom that, no, I am not interested in getting married. You have to put a stop to it. I think it came as a shock to her that, uh, you know, asexuality, uh, she probably would not have understood. If my dad was around, it would have been really, really easy because he was very progressive and very feminist. Uh, and um, which is why, you know, I think I was very close to him and I am who I am because of him. Um, but now she's like, okay, if that's what you want to do, I want you to be happy and I am with you, I'll stand by you, which is amazing. And uh, I think that has helped me come out to the public as well. Um, although, you know, it's, I still keep getting questions, uh, you know, if you bring the religion in, um, recently uh, so it was posted somewhere about asexuality and people bring in the religion part and the not having the children part that this is, an obligation we have to follow by getting married and uh, by having kids. Uh, when I was growing up, I even heard that if you don't get married by choice, your funeral is not even allowed in Islam. I'm not sure if it's true or not. I'm not a very practicing person, never was. Um, and I think in Pakistan, in, in a society like Pakistan, where there are a lot of asexual people, there are a lot of people from the LGBT community. However, they are forced into marriages, which is, which either results in marital rapes, which results in no intimacy between the partners and ruining the life of the other person as well, who, um, you know, doesn't know anything because you're not supposed to tell anything until you're married. Uh, you know, uh, those two people who are supposed to get married to each other are not even allowed to talk until the day they're married. And once they're married, then um, the other thing they would tell you to have kids to resolve issues between you. I don't understand when you two are not having any compatibility, how can having a child resolve the issues because that will just increase issues further. And I think more than women, it's the men, uh, when they come out as asexuals or aces, it's difficult for people to understand how can a man is he a robot, as our prime minister said, uh, yeah. Imran Khan recently. That was, that was <laughs> really bad. Yeah, so um, like people cannot understand how can men not want to have sex. Um, you know, like if you read about the news of any man or any person who identifies themselves as males um, get molested or harassed, people laugh at it. People don't take it seriously. Uh, people say that, how come you've not enjoyed it? You've obviously enjoyed it. That's not the same. Uh, harassment is harassment for any gender. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So it's, you know, it's very difficult for the society and religion and culture to understand because they're also intertwined in, in, in countries like India, Pakistan, and people are not willing to open their minds to it that, okay, maybe it's asexuality and they don't want it, leave them alone. But it becomes their, uh, you know, like a obligation for them to try to convert you. Maybe you have not slept with the right person. Maybe you could come and I will fix you. I have heard all kind of nonsense. And at times I want to punch people, but somebody even, it, it was a woman who actually told me, oh, why don't you try sleeping with women? And I'm like, it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Um, no offense to anyone, but you know, it's just, nobody turns me on. So yeah. um, I have, a, I'm sure you know, because you're my Facebook friend, Aisha. Yeah. I have, a, like, I am in total love with one of the actors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> but everyone thinks that I love him because 
I want to romance him or I want to be the heroine he's romancing in the movies. No, I want to be him. Mm. You know, the characters he plays, I can identify myself as those characters in, in certain ways. Or, you know, uh, so somebody said, oh, so if, if he comes and asks you to have sex with you, would you not want him? I think, no, I would sit there and talk to him. That's oh, what I, I want to I, be. I never thought like you wanted to be him. I so, want to be him. Okay, no now, now I'm so sorry. I didn't get that too. But anyways, see, the first thing I want to say is in countries like India, Pakistan and all other countries which do not know about asexuality or LGBTQ plus community, the problem is awareness. They don't even know what they are going through, right? They don't know there is something like asexuality existing. So anyways, thanks for that take. And Donovan, we move on to you. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I had like a pretty like solid structure of how I was going to answer this. But then after listening to Rachel and Sana, it just like went all over the place. So I'm going to try my <laughs> um, I do want to highlight something that Rachel said that really resonates with me. Um, so I am mixed but I am black basically. So I have a German grandma, but no one in America is going to look at me and say I'm white. Right. So people will look at me and say I'm black, but I'm mixed. I speak German, I have a German family. And so already within my identity, I was in the fringes where I'm not black, I'm not white. Right. And then with my sexuality, it was almost like I had to pick a battle between like, okay, like, do I fight for my race or do I fight for my sexuality? And so Donovan, I- we can't hear you properly. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, when I came out, it was like, this doesn't feel right, but I have to because like Sana was saying, um, bi- bisexuality, pansexuality, because back then there was no pansexuality spoken of in that way, it was bisexuality. Even in the gay community, like even more in the gay community, that was pushed down. Mm-hmm. Bi erasure is a real thing where people were like, oh, you're too afraid to say you're gay. Or like, this is like a stepping stone for you. And so I already had to kind of just swallow that. and. I didn't see any gay icons. The few icons that were out when I was a kid were white men um, and like Ellen DeGeneres. Um, And obviously I didn't see myself in any of them. And so I really struggled with trying to figure out who I was and that created a lot of internalized homophobia. Um, On top of the fact that within the black community, the most people that I have experienced homophobia from have been black men. And which, which is hard because it's like, we're in this shared struggle of being black men in America, but also we're not because you are being homophobic to me, right? And yeah. so it was like, I went to a Southern Baptist church where literally I told my mom I wanted, I stopped going for a while. I told her I wanted to go again because I wanted to feel spiritual. And we went and they, the first time we were there, the youth services did a like dangers of gay, like production it was like a play and my mom was like well let's go and so for me it's been about like like I had to like separate myself from these identities so much that it created a lot of like homophobia inside of myself that I didn't even know was there um so I think like being a black man um the work I do with kids is really around emotional growth and for a long time I didn't talk to kids about my sexuality because one, like, why do I have to? And Mm -hmm. two, that's what I thought at least. And two, it was like, this didn't, I didn't want kids to associate me being emotional with my sexuality. And as weird as that sounds, that was the case when I was younger. Anytime I cried, I was gay, right? Anytime I showed any kind of weakness, it was a derogatory gay term. And so I had, and I have three older brothers. And so I was like, well, I, I can't show this. I can't tell kids this is, I don't want them to make that connection. But actually when I did the Today Show, they, they like outed me. Like I didn't know that they were going to say in the production that I identified as queer, they said gay, but I didn't know that they were going to say that. And I got really upset at first because I was like, well, I don't want kids to know. I don't want kids to know. But then I thought about like how much it sucks that when I was a kid, mm-hmm. that I didn't have anybody, I'm going to get emotional. I didn't have anyone that I could look at and be like, that's me. Right. I felt so alone all of the time. And I felt so like, I don't fit in. I'm not a gay guy. I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not straight. I'm not this. Right. Like, who am I? And I struggled so much with my identity that I wanted to kill myself. And so when we talk about the safety of identity, right, I can't even imagine because my mom was so loving. I knew my brothers would be cool. And yet it was horrendous. And a lot of straight people will say like, 
you know, people, they will view coming out as this beautiful thing, but not recognize how hard it is. And like Rachel said, like, by the time I had to tell my oldest brother, I was like, yo, don't y'all all know? Like, why do I have to keep telling them? Why do I have to keep like bleeding? Why do I have to keep ripping the bandaid off for other people to know about my sexuality? But so when I realized like, it was around the same time I was asked to do this, thanks Rachel for like helping connect me to this opportunity because it was really symbolic because I was like, you know what? Like I, as I'm going into this world as a public figure for kids, I want those LGBTQT kids or those kids questioning or those mixed boys or those boys who have emotions. I want them to look at me and say, I can see myself in that, right? Because I didn't have that. And so it was tough, but now I realize how important it is for representation, how important it is for safety of identity um, because things are so much more on a scale than people think they are, right? And so when, if I have a white gay man who tells me I can't be gay because I don't like Madonna, I'm like, do you realize how limiting that is? Do you realize how you are painting what gay is yeah. in popular media, right? When there's like all these people. And so growing up, all of my relationships were with men who didn't identify as gay, they were, but they, they call themselves straight, but they had feelings for me and because there weren't words, because society didn't accept that, because people were like, oh, well, they're just secretly gay, right? Like these people struggled. I struggled. I didn't get to have open love because the people I love were afraid of their labels. They were afraid of who they were and stuff like that. And so for me now, um, creating safe, pace, safe, safe spaces for kids to really embrace their identity is like all these parts of their identity, mm-hmm. right? And to understand that like, I'm a black man, but that doesn't mean that I've had the same experience as black kids in America, right? It doesn't mean that I've had the same experience as gay kids growing up or LGBTQT kids coming up or, you know, like even like listening to Sana talk about asexuality, it's like, wow, like that's something that I've never even thought about, right? I'm learning just like gay people who will say like bisexuality doesn't exist. It's like, how can you say that? when straight people used to say the same thing to us, when straight people used to put people who were gay or LGBTQT or didn't fit heteronormative behavior in like mental asylums, right? Because they thought it was so bad. And so when people say things like asexuality aren't real, like Sana listening to you, my ears were getting caught. And I'm like, who are you to tell someone that, right? And I think that, I think with society and culture and religion, I think what becomes tough for me is I wanna lift up these things that are important to people, right? even if I don't understand that religion or I don't understand the culture because I'm not from it, I want to lift it up. But when those things start to oppress the way people live and the way that people identify and show up, especially my students, right? When I have kids who are crying and sobbing in my classroom because their parents told them they're going to burn in hell for supporting gay people, like that's when it becomes an issue. And that's when it's about like, well, what are we teaching this next generation, right? What are we teaching this next generation around inclusion? And not just saying like, forcibly accept everyone but really understanding how we create our identity like comes from our safety and love in the world and like Rachel said if someone if I put my identity out there someone could take that love away someone and someone could take that safety away and I'm going to be really honest with you all when I came out I was lucky I was really really lucky all three of my older black brothers were super loving right my mom was super loving and I was still terrified but let me put it this way the same time I came out another person who went to the high school with me came out and his dad broke both of his arms oh my god his dad broke both of his arms and kicked him out and at 15 my friend had to literally pick his life up and have to restart it and he is this awesome fantastic person now but I think about how lucky I was to have safety so when people say everyone should come out and when people push people to come out like like I don't subscribe to that because you got to be safe And if your family is threatening to physically hurt you or emotionally take love away from you, right? Like what is the point of forcing kids to come out if they know that they're not in a safe space like that? And so when you have people like Rachel who can create safe spaces for them, like 28 kids are like, boom, here is safety for me. And so it's a tough thing because I think a lot of straight people want to celebrate pride, but don't understand that underneath pride is, is a lot of trauma and a lot of like healing and a lot of individual experiences. The asexuality community is different from the transgender community, which is different from the gay men community, which is different from the queer black community, right? We all have these different things. And so I want to push people to really think about like how we experience pride, how people experience pride 
can bring up a lot of stuff. For some people, it's like, yeah, I want to go march through the streets. I'm really great. And then for some people, it could be a reminder of their family who abandoned them mm -hmm. when they came out, mm -hmm. right? Something yeah. that they were forced to do, something that straight people don't have to do, mm -hmm. right? And to be yeah. 13 and already be so unsure of yourself and to be forced into coming out or to be pressured into coming out by your peers. And when people say, I always knew, I always knew. I'm like, no, you didn't. You don't know until I tell you. You don't get to identify me. You don't get to make these snap judgments about me, right? Just because I act a certain way or I dress a certain way. That's wild to me. Sorry, that's my spiel. But, but <laughs> oh, Donovan, yes, I really want to tell you, like if you were here, I would have hugged you. But, you know, kudos to you for saying all this. And I'll tell you something. For me, it is like, leave people alone. <laughs> Let them live their life how they want to live, right? Why are you being the judge or why do you want them to live a certain way? It's not your life, it's their life. Let them have fun, let them live their life. But what you're doing is entirely different. Like you said, you as a public figure, you're telling the other kids or other people that it is okay. Yeah. It's okay to be you. It's okay to call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. Yeah. And you will... And you don't have to be accepted. You need to accept yourself. Yeah, that is I mean, the important thing. Build safety within yourself. Absolutely. Right? Build right? inner sanctuary, right? And it doesn't mean that you can't stand up or advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. right? Because these larger conversations need to happen. And advocacy is important. But at the same time, I think something that we're missing with just kids in general, um, one of the things that I really love about like the work that Rachel does is really helping kids cultivate that safety. Yeah. cultivate that because if we are creating safety for kids and then it's gone as soon as we're gone right that's not giving them justice but if we can create safety for them and help them also create safety for themselves yeah right to be able to say to myself to be able to look in the mirror and say this is who i am this is what i define myself this is my identity i love who i am like that's the real work you know and i think for lgbtq kids it's even more important because their identity is consistently under attack um yeah in every arena you know what I mean like in every single arena so yeah I mean I just, I'm like Jonathan I'm about to like hold myself back because I have like everything you're saying is like but you know oh there's so many things in my head but I want to say that um yeah build safety in ourselves but but the okay the education system needs to step up I yeah. have been in education for 20 years. I've been with the board for 10 years and I can count on my freaking hands how many people are out to students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have probably three, maybe two, two or three. Out to staff, yes. Out to students, no. When I look at what my niece like plays with, with the dolls, with the videos, with Barbies, it's hypersexualization of yeah. like heterosexuality. It's sickening. Mm -hmm. And like my preteens that have come out within this safe space over the past year have talked about we human beings need representation. When we, when we see ourselves and all minorities and all diversities and all spectrums of everything, we need to see ourselves. I don't know what that is psychologically. Maybe Aisha, you can tell me, but like we need to like, when we don't see ourselves, we only see like Donovan, you're talking about like, you know, the fact that we had like Ellen DeGeneres, but she's a white woman. We have like a couple representations I, recently, I was watching uh, Manifest, which is freaking the heck, of a, uh, heck out of me. But all of a sudden, this like, you know, kind of like, quote unquote, more straight looking woman has this like girlfriend that she loves. And I was like, oh my God, this is not a gay show. This is amazing. We need representation. We need uh, schools to be a safe space across the board and including with like, you know, what are your gender, what, what's your pronouns? Sorry, not what's your gender, what's your pronouns? Just starting out with, with teachers normalizing it. I, I had a couple of years back, because I'm not always out to my students, a couple of years back I had, because um, I don't always feel safe. And that bothers me, that like breaks my heart that I'm scared of like people that are having homophobic, you know, belief systems, um, religious homophobic belief systems or just their belief systems and what their families will do What's the principal going to do? So that scares me. So I'm not always out, which no, I know that that's impacting queer youth and not only queer youth, all of humanity, because the more that we stand in our truth, the more that we open up space to like be in our truth and our full diversity of whatever that is. 
So I had this student come out to me. Um, she was from Jamaican background. I had literally just met her that day because I supply teach, substitute teach. And she was like, you know, telling me during the work, she was crying. She felt comfortable with me. She's like, I think I'm a lesbian, but I don't know what to do because like my parents continually say homophobic things. This is not against Jamaican culture at all. This is what she was telling me. She's like my culture, like with my family, you know, um, and I'm, I'm scared for my safety. And so I was, I was like, I can't sit here and not tell this child that I'm a queer person. And, and I wasn't out to the class. So I was like, sweetie, I totally understand. And, you know, it, like you should do things that feel safe. And like, I was trying to like set her up, but I'm there for half a day. So I went to my other school, which was on the other side of the city. And I went to the school that I know very well. I was like, kind of like a secondary teacher for this class. And I walked past the token poster safe spaces with like the trans child and the rainbow flag and all the things and then it doesn't have like anything it just says we are a safe space and like it's a poster including with like no bullying policy and zero tolerance here i walked past it and i'm like okay i'm a queer person okay and uh i looked at the poster more carefully because it's on every school like in you know my board and i was like where 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 is the safe space i see like a triangle with the like rainbows where like, where do I go? If I'm a child and I feel afraid for my safety, if I am questioning my sexuality, if I'm just struggling because I'm afraid that love is going to be withdrawn or I'm going to be judged, like, which is a major thing, a trauma in itself, where do I go? There's no number. There's no teacher. So I asked my students that day and I said, where would you guys go if you needed to come out or talk to somebody? They're like, we don't know. Like, we have a poster, but we don't know where to go. Like, that's the problem. So like, there's so much like yeah. kind of just like checking off a box, like, oh, we brought in like a queer speaker. And then we go back to like, not talking about what happens or all the things that say in the hallway, like that's so gay or whatever. Like we, we need to actually put action. Like I am so sick of, I love talking, but I'm sick of talking and not having action paired with it. I need action and I need to see what people's steps are. Um, you know, I need to know that it's not just a safe space for my kids, it's a safe space for me. Like, yeah. how do people make that a safe space as an adult being a queer person in a school system? And the school system is where, as we all know, most of humanity goes through those doors. So if most of humanity goes through those doors, if it is not a safe space for whatever diversity you are, including a sexual identity, we have a problem. No, that, that is just not the problem only for the uh, kids to have a safe space with LGBTQ. It is also for mental health, right? Yes. You feel you're feeling depressed, you're anxious, where do you go? It is written that, yes, you have a self-invent worker, but why can't, why can't the teachers be trained? Why can't there be a everyday, uh, like a gym period? There's a mental health period, a safe space where you can talk about anything teach teachers about it yeah right absolutely donovan and me are going to take over the world with this yeah i know you need to do it donovan but 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 let's go back to our questions yeah, yeah. and this is a very important one because you know when somebody cannot express who they are and they have to suppress themselves like you all have said now it affects your mental health mm -hmm. it creates addiction anxiety depression suicidal thoughts like you said Jonathan as Donovan sorry and uh, you know how do you deal with this this stigma what are what are the tips or what do you want to tell what is the solution in your opinion for people or kids or individuals who are going through this so let's go quickly Sana let's hear it from you um I think um when especially as an asexual person, it's very difficult to explain what it is. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, yeah. the society does not understand that it's okay to live without sexual contact or, uh, you know, you can still have sexual contact, but it's just that you don't want to, uh, you know, start it, initiate it. Um, it's because again, like sexuality, I say, asexuality is the opposite of sexuality and it has the whole umbrella of LGBT as well and people fall on you know different um, places on the spectrum um, when you you have to suppress in a society like Pakistan even in the UK for example it's uh, I, I've met so many people who who just do not understand um, uh, I don't know if anyone had read the news about um, recently how in certain cities there were riots about 
sex education. Yeah. Uh, people did not Happens want their kids to have Toronto. sex education. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, I think the LGBT education can be integrated with sex education. You know, it, you can start over there. Um, Mm-hmm. And that would be easier for children to come out to teachers, um, you know, for example, that's because that's the age when you start questioning yourself or start experimenting or whatever, you know, you go through the emotions mostly around once you he- uh, reach puberty. Um, so why can't we uh, just make it normal? You know, they bring in, in, in Muslim society, they bring in uh, the prophet, Lou, that how his... Um, nation was uh, you know destructed because he uh, they, they were homosexuals um so you know uh, stoning to death is the um and even recently uh, there, there was a case where a cleric islamic cleric was molesting a child and the report was not uh, for molesting the student uh, against him the fir or the initial report it was for having unnatural sex so in um there was another series i was watching in uh, it was an indian series um something related to crime and they also reported it as unnatural sex anything with homosexuality is considered unnatural sex that's not unnatural sex that's very natural it's just that it's not something that heterosexual people do even they do that uh so um you know, uh, it's very difficult to come out again. And when, you know, it starts affecting your mental health, when you're living in a box, when you know that you can't go out and tell your parents, and especially when they start forcing in pressure, uh, you know, you have societal pressures of getting married, having kids. You just don't want that. You want to live your life. Coming out of the closet is one of the most, exp- uh, you know, difficult things. And in in certain places, um, you know, when I started my mental health therapy, uh, while I was on the waiting list of NHS, I went to this uh, women's center, uh, my GP recommended. And the person was so homophobic, so acephobic. And I was like, I can't do that. She was like, oh, you should learn to cook. You Because you're a girl, you should cook. And I'm like, no, I don't cook. And I am not going to cook because every time I pick up a knife, I want to kill myself. It's not safe for me. Yes, it may be chopping vegetables might be therapeutic for some people. It is not for me. So, you know, um, again, as we said, mental health, um, my university offered six weeks of mental health support, but that's it. What happens after six weeks? Recently, I was talking to my GP because I have been, have uh, as I have endometriosis, it affects my mental health as well. And being an asexual person, it's all a lot. So my GP was telling me that the whole spectrum, there is a spectrum of people with mental health conditions as well. The ones who are n- not too uh, vulnerable, the GPs handle them, give them medication and they're fine. And the ones who are like at the verge of killing themselves are the ones who are actually given the treatment in NHS. While the people who fall in the gray area who can either be treated by medication or, you know, until they reach the extreme stage, they're not given treatment. So what do you, what do you do? No, that is the problem. Exactly yeah. like Rachel said, it has to be brought down to the roots. It has to be started at the school level. So everybody gets that education. Everybody gets that knowledge. Everybody knows the solution, what to be done when it happens to you. And, you know, when you started at the school level, you don't need practitioners alone. Every other person, even the person sitting next to you knows how to handle it or how to make it better, at least at the initial stage, at the basic stage. Then if it is not happening, you know who who you can direct them to, right? Yes. So I, I think that's a very valid point. Where do you lie? Do you get treatment only when you are at the extreme or you get treated because you need it. So yeah. thanks for that, Sana. Donovan, what do you have to say? What is the solution for it? Because, you know, it's it's easy to talk about problems. But yeah. right now at Public Allies, and I especially feel it is important to talk about solutions. What are you giving? What is the solution for this? Well, I think um, what Rachel especially said. Especially mental health. Yeah. 
what Rachel said too about it starting in school was super important. We just did sex ed at my school and it was the most comprehensive sex ed I've ever seen. And there was two days around like romance and relationships. And not only did it talk about the whole gamut of the types of romances or attractions that people had, it talked about toxic relationships, it talked about behaviors, mm -hmm. and it was so easy. And to hear kids just be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I didn't know there was a word for that. I had to turn my screen off. I was teaching with two other teachers. I haven't shared this out loud publicly, but I had to turn my screen off because I started crying because they described a relationship that finally gave me a word to describe the one real relationship I had in my life. And because we didn't have a word and we didn't know that this was a thing, it fell apart, right? But when I was reading it, listening to it and hearing it normalized, I like started to break down because I was like, man, if I would have known this when I was a kid, I would have had yeah. access to this language. And the work that I do with kids is really about getting them access to language to help them articulate their skills, their strengths, their values, their passions in the world. Because what I've seen is when you give kids the space and the, the resources to be able to process and think about these bigger things, they will do it. And so absolutely on an educational level and a structural level, we need to be doing this work, but we also need to be teaching kids how to build positive self-identity, right? That yeah. comes from their humanity, that comes from all these different parts of who they are, because that for a lot of people, like I've suffered with depression and anxiety since I was a kid because of multiple ACEs um, that I had in my life, like adverse childhood um, uh, experiences like that led me to have mental health, but also a lot of my mental health issues came from me hating myself and me not being able to lift myself up or build myself or understand myself. And so I think that it's a two tier thing. It's like we need to, or just like a two level thing. We need to bring adults into this work. We need to push past prejudice. We need to think about the community we're serving, right? If you have older people, I'm sorry. If you have older people saying, this makes me uncomfortable. This wasn't like education when I was a kid, good good right because you're not in school anymore you're not the future they are the future their world is different than ours and so for us to be making these rules and these decisions that don't affect us right and that affect them doesn't make any sense to me so we need to bring kids into this work as well specifically on giving them the skills and tools to take care of themselves and to feel positive not to just put a poster on the wall that says love yourself or put a poster that says be kind like okay Right. Yeah. right. How do I love myself? And so I, I think with, with both of those things, I think it's super, super important that we really just we think about the work and service of the kids. And when you think about even educating about LG, LGBTQT, a lot of times it's educating straight heteronormative people, just like a lot of the equity meetings I would go to for like pro black would be more for the white people in the room to learn, right? And the black people are kind of put in the situation of let's bring up your trauma, right? And so even this, like, don't bully gay people, don't bully, don't do this, don't do this. Who's talking to those kids? Who's talking to the LGBTQT kids about their own experience, about their identity, about how to lift themselves up through oppression? That's not happening. And so we're still doing this work in service of heteronormative, uh, heteronormativity. It's still being geared towards them, and it's actually being geared towards this youth. So. I think it's a huge question. I think that's like the question for the next one. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Forever. you. I'd just like to add something here as well yeah. with regards to asexuality. A lot of people who uh, identified themselves uh, as asexuals have some sort of child abuse, sexual mm -hmm. child abuse, uh, that could put them off from uh, forming the sexual relationships of any sort. Uh, and that in turn affects the mental health. So, you know, if we have safe spaces in school. Uh, mm -hmm. If the parents are not listening to you, if you go and tell them, especially in cultures like India, Pakistan, where you know, you're know you told to shut up if you go and complain about the relative that they are molesting or harassing you or abusing you, schools should be those spaces where you could go and speak to a teacher, a counselor, or somebody who could help you mm -hmm. raise the alarm and maybe make your parents understand mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people actually live with that childhood trauma, as you mentioned, um, and then it affects their lives at later stage, even their marital lives. Yeah. So I think that's very important as well. It is. Absolutely, Sana. Wonderful point. Rachel, oh, what's the solution? So I'm just like nodding and nodding. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, 
one of the things I just want to say is like, if you're not the minority of whatever the minority is, the racial minority, the um, disabled minority, the uh, queer minority, sh like sit down and shut up and listen. Listen to what people are going through. Like, just be quiet. Just be quiet. Like the more that we actually listen to each other, you know, like this is really, this is, this is the first like larger conversation that I've had in a deeper context about asexuality. And I'm learning a lot now, you know, yeah. I want to learn. And if those people that don't want to learn, and it doesn't have to be older because I'm like in my forties now and I'm starting to be considered the OG. Um, like if they don't want to learn, put them in a room together, let them talk to each other. Like, just like, like, like let's normalize listening and having conversations and talking about it. And I agree with you, Donovan, what you're saying about how, you know, we're still trying to like educate kind of like the heteronormative people, like don't try and kill somebody because they're gay. Don't say that's gay because it's harmful, but then like all these queer experiences of these youths. And there is something really sick about the hypersexualization and heteronormativity of our world. Like there's something wrong. Like, I don't know why this is happening, but we can't have like healthy examples of queer, um, you know, people that are that are in our media, um, in society. Um, and the thing is that we, like human beings, like we're only here for, I mean, maybe we'll be here at different lives. I don't really know, but let's like live this one first. And we're here for this one. And we have this certain amount of time and the amount of trauma that happens like in early childhood, to feel like you are not loved, you are not valued, you are not seen, you are not safe, that impacts everything. So yeah, it's gonna have a mental health effect, it's gonna have a physical health effect at certain times, and um, that's not okay. And so I, um, I'm all for free speech, but hate speech is not free speech. Let's make yeah, that really clear. Absolutely. It is not free speech. And I am all for um, religious freedoms until there's hate speech, and then it's not free. Like it, it, it just, we have, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, like we're both in Canada here and we're having like all these things uncovered, you know, like tragedies that have happened to First Nations people um, yeah. at the hands of religious leaders and our, and our government. So we need to do better. We just need to do better. And to me, I just look at humanity and I think we have been living on this planet for so long. How don't we know these things? Like, how is it not okay to like have a partner of the same sex, understand that there's intersex people, understand that there's asexuality, like we, and, and the way that we don't know that is we're not properly educating people. And I think we really do. I know I'm, I'm part of a board, but I think that all education all over the world needs to take a serious hard look at what we are doing. Like the house is kind of on fire here in terms of our world, in terms of our humanity. And the more people that feel connected to their hearts and love, I'm like getting chills. I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling it. Connected <laughs> to their hearts and feel free to just be themselves and their most loving selves. That is the way we're gonna change the world. And I'll say this too, is that Mr. Rogers and Won't You Be My Neighbor. So anybody who's not seen that movie, you must, it's your homework from Miss Rainbow Fairy. Won't you be my neighbor? Mr. Rogers talks about one of the most violent things you can do is turn somebody against themselves. And so me as a survivor of bullying and it is abuse for so many years, um, you know, was turned against myself. Like I hated myself and, and I'm still having to unpack that. I still have impact on that every single day of my life. Hopefully, you know, there'll be a day that I don't, but I don't know. I mean, that kind of trauma runs deep. And also being a queer person, right? That's kind of like, you know, an unaccepted person. Like these are unaccepted people, you know? And, and I, I mean, it's just not okay. It's not okay and, and we need to do better. And I think it really comes down to like, you know, unfortunately people are with families that, you know, so many queer people have to, or in the LGBTQ plus spectrum, have to find chosen family because you know they don't have family because they're excommunicated because they're in danger so you know our human family needs to do better and that starts with you know education it starts with safe spaces normalizing like feelings normalizing difference um listening to the people that are experiencing things um that are more like that are di are difficult we have to listen we need to listen yeah. we need to let those people talk um and I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. No, <laughs> we are almost at the end of it. I'm so sorry. This was so interesting and so engaging. Uh, that is exactly what we want to do. 
we want to create awareness we want people to come and talk about it not feel uh, like it's a topic which you can't be discussing uh, the other day we had a women's health and men's health uh, webinars and round tables and they were talking about it's okay to be emotional and women we were talking about all the stigma attached to sexuality and sex and everything so you know you need to talk more women's health men's health is not only about physical health there's more to it than that right so we have we are talking about something but i hope like you know um we create some awareness yes donovan you wanted to say something <laughs> yeah i um yeah Put me and Rachel together anytime. We'll, I know. I feel like we're and we're also like raising our hands. We're raising our hands. <laughs> I know. <laughs> to see more, right? But I think one of the things I do in my work with kids is really highlight growth moments, so kids can see literally shifts in perspectives and growth moments. And Rachel kind of beat me to it, but I'm glad that you did because I wanted to thank Sana. I wanted to be like, this is the first time. You know, I've always identified as queer even before I knew what it was. This is the first time where I've heard someone talk about their experience with asexuality and someone doing that and just sitting here and listening I feel like a part of my mind has opened mm -hmm. and it wasn't that it was closed off before but it was just literally because I, no one has been given the space to do that like this and so yeah. for me to just sit here and listen Sana I'm so grateful I'm so I'm getting chills right now because I'm just so grateful because I know how difficult it is for me to justify my existence to people who I don't need to do that with, right? And so to talk to people who have even like more of a, a, a small, or not smaller, like a, a more unique experience like asexuality, um, that's going to come with lots of more challenges that I'm never going to have to face or lots of more explanations I'm never going to have to give coming from a culture um, that pushes you to be a certain way or to do certain things. I just feel really honored and grateful to sit here and listen to you and what Rachel was saying about these conversations like this is what it should look like mm -hmm. I, we're brought on as the panelists but I just learned a ton <laughs> from you, right I just learned a ton from you and and that's how I think education should be where we're all learning from each other and the last thing I wanted to say is Rachel you said people turning and turning themselves against each other schools can no longer be that yeah Schools can no longer be a place that turns kids against themselves because education is one of the biggest culprits of that Mainstream education is one of the main causes that turns people against themselves when they're kids. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have time for questions, so we will keep it for next time. Hopefully we'll come back again, a part two of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was wonderful. Like you said, I have learned so much about all the communities. Maybe I'll be better at speaking about them in future. So thank you guys for coming here. But all this, like, you know, we spoke about diversity and gender, but what's the solution to this social issue or social cause? Inclusion. I feel inclusion can bring about such a change. It is a step to move forward where effort and practices in which different groups and individuals having different backgrounds, culturally and socially, are accepted and welcomed and treated equally. It is a sense of belonging, making people feel respected and valued for who they are as an individual or a group. And that is so important in a society. Mm -hmm. Evidence also shows that when people feel valued, they function at full capacity and feel part of the society's mission to grow and thrive as they are motivated and have a morale boost. When one feels a level of supportive energy and commitment from others, they become the best version of themselves. Inclusion often means a shift in mindset and culture that has visible effects such as better life and better community. I want to leave you all with this quote. Equality means more than passing laws. The struggle is really one in the hearts and minds of the community where it really counts. I heard it from a friend and uh, I just want to thank her for that. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much again. This was wonderful. And I promise you we'll come back again and talk more about it. Thanks, Sana, for joining us. It's late, we understand, but thanks for joining us. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Donovan. It was such a wonderful conversation. I don't want to stop, but we are at the end of it. 
So keep the conversation going. And anytime you want to come on Public Allies and talk about it, please do. And thanks to our viewers who have been with us. I see uh, uh, Niru has been constantly messaging. And thank you, Niru, for that. Take care, guys. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Bye.